Well, every, every parent knows the, the feeling of tucking your child uh, safely into bed at night, and then before you, as the mom or the dad, go to bed, you know what it's like to sort of move through the house, methodically checking each door lock, making sure that everything in the house and around the house is secure, maybe stepping on the porch or looking out the window and surveying the yard, perhaps alarming or, or arming, I should say, an alarm system or a security system. And before you lay your head, before you pillow your head at night, you do what you can to guard your home, to protect your home. One particular home security system uh, commercial dramatizes this nightly routine by having a father doing just that, tucking his child into bed and then sort of going around looking out the window. And as he peers out the window into the dark night, presumably filled with threats to his family and his possessions, he says these words, not on my watch, as he then arms his alarm system, which would help him protect his home. It's pretty, it's powerful images. It's, it's really good advertising. And the message of the advertising is this, I will guard what I've gained. Or we would say, I will guard what God has given me. And so here's a question for you to consider this morning. Is there a security system for joy? Is there a way that we can guard the joy that God has given us? Or is our joy extremely vulnerable? Is it always at risk? Is it always exposed, always fragile? Are we apt at any given moment, on any given day, under, under any random circumstance to plummet from the heights of joy and suddenly be in the depths of despair? Or is there a way that we can guard our joy? Well, this is what we're going to talk about today as we're in Philippians chapter number four and coming to the close of this series. Now, since this is our final week, our fifth of five weeks in the book of Philippians, let me just remind you very quickly of the choices that we've learned to make or the things that we need to know in order to choose to have unwavering joy. So let's remember how we get it or how we choose it, and then we'll end the series today by thinking about how we guard it, okay? So you'll remember, I hope, all the way back in the first week, we were in chapter one and verse number six, where we discovered that joy comes from knowing, it's about knowledge, knowing that God will finish the work of grace that he's begun in me. Philippians 1 and verse 6 says this, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. There's the base, there's the knowledge base that, I, that gives me joy. It is that God has started something in me. He's not going to uh, go off and not finish the work. God will complete the work of grace. In week number two, we were in chapter one and verse 21, where we learned that joy comes from choosing to live for Jesus fully in this life. Really important to know. Listen carefully. The most miserable person on the planet is the Christian not serving God. Far more miserable than the non-Christian not serving God. When we come to faith in Jesus, if we then choose to live for ourselves, that's a path of, of unhappiness and disappointment and frustration and misery, but joy comes when, as a believer in Christ, I determine that I'm going to live fully for Him. Chapter 1, verse 21 For to me, Paul says, to live is Christ. The purpose of my drawing breath, the purpose of my life is to live for Jesus. And then when I die, well, that's just gain. I'm, I'm going to heaven. Week number three, we were in chapter 2 and verse 5, where we learned that joy comes when we walk in humility. You wouldn't naturally think that. The world wouldn't tell you that. It's counterintuitive, but joy doesn't come. When I drive my way to the top, joy comes when I yield, when I surrender, when I sacrifice, and when I serve. Chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind 
or attitude be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And he goes on in verse 6 and following to talk about the humility of Jesus. All right, so joy comes, I know God's going to finish what he started, I determined to serve him, and I walk in humility. And then last week we were in chapter 3 and verse number 14, where we learned that joy comes from a growing knowledge and intimacy with Jesus. In other words, I don't just come to faith and then I, st- I stop growing forever. Joy comes as I'm growing deeper and deeper in my walk with the Lord. Chapter 3 verse 14 says it this way, I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call or the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is that upward call, that constant progress in my walk with the Lord. That is a, is a, a source of joy. So that's how we get it, right? That, those are the choices that we make in order, the things that we know in order to have joy. So you come to chapter number four, and Paul uh, speaks to us in this passage about how to guard the joy that we've, that we've gained. Let's just pick the text up. Chapter four of Philippians and verse number four. Philippians four and verse four says, we've looked at this verse repeatedly, so you know it. Here we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. Always rejoice in the Lord And again, I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of a good report, if there is anything virtuous or anything worthy of praise, think on, set your mind on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. By the way, there's a great model here for every parent, every influencer of anyone, every teacher, every pastor. Here's what we can learn. He says in verse number nine, don't just listen to what I've said, but do what you've seen me do, right? So monkey see, monkey do, right? So we, we're often guilty of saying, look, don't, 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 don't do what I, what I do, but do what I say. Paul says, no, you've learned from me, not just in the things that I've taught you or what you've received from me or what you've heard from me, but the things that you've seen in me. Do those things. And he says, if you will, the God of peace shall be with you. Now, many of you have your pens in your hand uh, because you are faithful note takers. I'm so glad that you are. I want you to take that pen and in the Bible, in your actual Bible text, I want you to circle uh, just a few words. So go back up to verse number four. I want you to circle the word rejoice. And as you know, it's, it's found two times in verse number four. Uh, rejoice. You'll remember the word rejoice means a calm cheerfulness. Joy is a calm cheerfulness that's deeply settled in my soul. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice, all right? And then I want you to go to verse number seven and circle these three words, peace of God. The peace of God are those four words. And the peace of God. And then again, in verse number nine, the God of peace. So you're really circling three things. You're circling rejoice, you're circling the peace of God, and you're circling the God of peace. Now, can I ask you a question? Um, Have you ever noticed, and this is true throughout Scripture, that the Bible oftentimes presents joy and peace as complementary to one another? Have Have you ever noticed this? That the Bible often presents joy and peace in this way, that when there is peace, the attendant uh, emotion that comes along with being at peace is joy. And then the flip side of that, vice versa, uh, is true as well. That when I am walking in joy, it is because there is a peace that is within me. Now look at it from the negative. If I 
don't have joy, then I'm typically unsettled and lacking peace. And if I don't have peace, then it's difficult to have joy. The Bible really presents joy and peace as two sides of the same coin. They go together. A couple of, of examples from Scripture. Look at Isaiah 55 and verse number 12, which says, For you shall go out with joy, you shall be led forth with peace. Saying that God's going to carry you forth, lead you on in both joy and peace. In Romans 15 and verse number 13, the Bible says, May the God of hope fill you just with joy, no. Just with peace? No. You get the coin. You get both sides of the coin. Joy and peace. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. So all the way through the book of Philippians, we, we said in the beginning, I think it averages about one every four or five words in the entire letter Paul's theme has been joy. I'm rejoicing. You should rejoice. Let's rejoice. Here's why we can joy, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice. His theme has been rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Now he comes to the end of the letter, chapter number four, and as he's closing his letter, he begins to talk about, all right, now we've chosen to rejoice, so how can we guard the joy that we have? And in chapter number four, as he moves to conclude this, this letter, um, he begins to acknowledge uh, something very important to know in a fallen world. Write it down. He acknowledges that we all face threats to our joy. Now, I want to be joyful, and I should choose joy. And as we've learned, there are things I need to know that give me joy. There are choices I need to make that will produce joy. But I also have to be honest and say that there are things that threaten my joy. Paul says this very plainly in verse number six when he says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication make your request known unto God. And so he says in verse number six, look, I, I want you to be careful for nothing. The word careful, it doesn't mean don't be careful. He means don't be filled with care, Okay. The word careful means to be anxious. Maybe you have a more modern translation of the Bible. That's likely what it says. Be anxious for nothing. It means to, to carry about the burden, to walk around with this heavy burden of circumstance in your life. He says, don't carry around the weight or the anxiety of that burden. Be careful for nothing. But... Here's the acknowledgement, but in everything, I love this, be careful in, or anxious for nothing, but in everything that could cause you anxiety, right? So he's not saying there's nothing to cause you anxiety. In fact, he implies in verse six when he says, but in everything that would cause you anxiety, in everything, he's saying there's plenty to be anxious about. Can I ask you a question? Do you think there's a lot of things in this world or in your life that you could be worried about? Can I get a witness? A lot of things. There are plenty of things. In fact, he goes on to say, in everything, make your requests. There's not just one, usually. There's multiple. Make your requests known to the Lord. What are the things right now that you're worried about? What is it? What are the things that when you woke up this morning, that it wasn't long after you put your feet on the floor, as happens every morning, those things came into your mind? What were the things that at some point during the night, last night or the, or the previous night, 2 o'clock, 3.30, 4.47, you were laying awake staring at the ceiling? And the things on your mind when you were laying awake staring at the ceiling were... What were they? Maybe it had to do with health concerns. You're awaiting test results, or maybe the test results have come back. You're undergoing treatment. You've got some symptoms that you're uncertain what they mean, and maybe it's health concerns in your own body or the, the life of somebody that you love. Are you concerned about financial needs? Very real, very pressing, very heavy obligations that you have to meet. Are you concerned about your kids? 
Maybe they're getting ready to start school and you're, you're worried, you're, you're anxious about how they're going to deal with peer pressure and temptation. Maybe they're going off to college or university. This has been a big weekend. A lot of families moving their kids onto college campuses this weekend as, as campuses are reconvening. Maybe you're concerned about the choices they're going to make now that they've got some freedom to do some things outside of your control. Maybe you have wayward children, sick children. Does it have to do with your work? Maybe job security is not so great. Maybe there's a pressing project or a, 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 the pressures to produce more and more. I, I don't know what it might be. What is it? What are the things you worry about? Maybe it's the state of our nation. Man, there's plenty to worry about in terms of our nation. What's happening with the rancor and the anger and the, and the divide that's getting deeper and wider in our country. I could go on and on, but my question is, Paul says in verse number 6, in everything, list them. What, what, what are they? I think it would be helpful for you if maybe right now or sometime this afternoon you would write them down. What are two or three things that are just in the forefront of your mind that you are anxious about? And whatever they are, here's what Paul would acknowledge, that each of these things that we would jot down are a constant threat to our joy. While we may put on a happy face, while we may appear to be carefree, the fact is, inwardly, we're often brooding and, and fretting and worried because these things are going on. Maybe you don't want other people to see it, but it's just beneath the surface. Verse number seven talks about our hearts and our minds. He says, the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds. So what is it that's at risk with these burdens? It's my, it's, it's my heart, it's my mind, it's my, my emotional, my spiritual well-being is at risk. You remember in week number one, we learned that when, when Philippians 4.4 4 says rejoice in the Lord always, we talked about that, that ebb and flow of life, right? Remember that? That sort of a wavelength where we have mountain peaks and valleys, but there is that unchanging, steady, solid line of Jesus that just pierces through all of the ups and downs and he never changes. And Paul says we're to rejoice not in this, but we're to rejoice in this. We're to rejoice in Jesus who never, ever changes. And it's that, it's that immutable, that unchanging, bedrock, solid foundation of Jesus, which is the basis of the peace which secures our unwavering joy. Jesus is the peace. You remember Jesus said just before he left here, my peace I leave with you. My peace I'm giving unto you. Uh, you remember he said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, be joyful, for I have overcome the world. It is that unchanging, immutable character of Jesus which is the foundation of the peace that secures our heart our joy through the ups and downs of life. And that, is, that leads us to understanding the big idea in this passage. In fact, in your, in your handbook, you should fill in some blanks and write this down if you have it. The big idea of this passage is actually the second point of the message. It is to say that the peace of God is the guardian. The peace of God is the guardian of Christian joy. I want to have joy. I want to choose joy. I want to know the right things, think the right way so that I can have joy. I want to make the right choices so that I can have joy, but life is still going to do this. Even when I make the right choices, life is still going to do that. So how can I have joy? How can it be guarded through all of those ebbs and flows of life? It is the peace of God which guards that joy. Here's a way that I would say it. Is that he tells us in this passage that, that our joy can thrive. Our joy can thrive under the protection of peace. I want to show you this in the passage. I'm not just making the words up. Look at verse number seven. He says in verse seven, and the peace of God, the peace of God, everybody both campuses say those words, peace of God, say it, peace of God. And the peace of God, he says in verse number seven, which passes all understanding, shall 
keep your hearts and minds. The word keep is a military term. The word means to guard. It's the idea of a sentry on post. And you have an encampment or a, or a home or a platoon or an embassy or whatever, and on the outside of that, that place of safety, that place of joy, there is a sentry, there's a guard, there's an MP who's watching the edges, who's guarding the perimeter so that the tranquility within can be safeguarded. Here's what he says in verse number seven. The peace of God is the guardian of my joy. The peace of God is the soldier, the heavenly marine, if you will, guarding the joy of my life. Our lives might be like, I don't know, you know, imagine an, a U.S. embassy in some part of the world, some war-torn country, where there are various factions fighting against each other, and it's sort of a lawless place, and the government has collapsed, and, and different uh, groups have risen up trying to take power, and there's fighting, and you got guys riding around in the backs of pickup trucks with, with weapons, and it's just chaos, and, and it's danger, and it's threat, and right in the middle of it is a U.S. embassy. U.S. territory in the middle of that. And inside that U.S. embassy is the ambassador and his family and, and all the State Department employees and their families and, and there's children and, and, and the, whole, the whole U.S. community is gathered in that embassy. And all around that safe place is chaos and calamity and confusion and danger. But they can put their head on their pillow at night and rest well because they know the Marines are at the gate. Amen? This is what the Bible says that peace does. We have been given joy. We can choose to live with unwavering joy. While we might live in a world full of chaos and calamity, and while our circumstances and the people around us and the things coming against us might be very, very horrible, we can have joy and peace because there is a guard at the gate. And the guard is the peace of Almighty God that he has given to us. That's what verse number seven says. The peace is the guardian, and the peace of God will guard your hearts. It will keep your hearts and your minds. If I know that, if I know the peace of God has been given to me, Jesus said, I am giving you peace. I'm choosing joy. He has given me peace. Can I say it that way? I'm not choosing peace. I'm choosing joy. He has promised me. He has given me peace. And the peace that he's promised guards the joy that we have chosen. I mentioned a moment ago, the word joy means a calm cheerfulness within. It is a resolute joy. Doesn't mean I'm happy about circumstances. Doesn't mean I like what's going on. Doesn't mean I'm comfortable in the situation. But within my soul, regardless of what's happening, I have a calm, resolute cheer uh, in my confidence toward the Lord. That's joy, and I can have it because God's peace Guards it. So what does it look like? When we live with that joy guarded by God's peace, what does that look like? Well, several things the passage would tell us. Look at uh, verse number uh, four again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Verse five, let your moderation be known unto all men. All right, so as you're choosing joy, it's guarded by God's peace. You're experiencing joy in the midst of chaos. What does it look like? Here's what it looks like. Write it down. It looks like gentleness or a gentle spirit. It looks like a gentle spirit. Let your moderation be known to all man, uh, men. In other words, for the believer who has chosen joy and that joy is being guarded by the peace of God, everyone will see there will be an obvious uh, a gentleness, an obvious gentle spirit about that person when everybody else is freaking out. It's true. When peace is guarding our joy, we don't have to freak out. 
Now, if you're listening, shout amen. Amen. Have you ever freaked out? (laughs) Some of you are thinking, the more you talk about my problems, I'm freaking out right now. (laughs) Now, Listen, I get it. We all freak out sometimes. And and we all kind of get alarmed and and over the top sometimes. But here's what the Bible says. That if I have chosen peace, and if or chosen joy, and if the peace of God is guarding my joy, then, then what will happen more and more as we grow deeper and more complete in it is that there will be a settled, a gentleness, a moderation about our responses that will be obvious to everybody. And they will begin to say, look at that guy, look at that gal, As they go through that difficulty, there's such a gentleness about them. They're not panicking. They're not freaking out. They're not throwing things. They're not running and screaming. Because they, their moderation, their gentle spirit is obvious. The second thing it looks like is the Lord's presence. I love verse 5. Let your moderation be known to all men. Second part of verse 5 says, the Lord is at hand. So what does it look like when I'm choosing joy, I'm guarded by God's peace in the midst of difficulty? Here's what I know. That the reason I can be moderate or gentle in my responses, I don't have to freak out, is because who is with me? The Lord is with me. If I wake up in the morning, I hope it doesn't happen, But if I wake up in the morning and the bottom of my life falls out, I I really hope it doesn't. But if it does, here's what I know. The Lord is near. He's with me. And if you have entered into a valley in your life where you are walking in the deepest difficulty you've ever experienced, here's what you know. The Lord is near. I don't have to freak out. I I, I can be moderate and gentle. I can still have joy and be guarded by that peace because I am not alone. The Lord is at hand. He's near. And by the way, it might also mean, I, I I would say it does mean, it also would allude to this fact that not only is he present with me now by his spirit, but he's near. That is, he's near to his return. I may be going through a difficulty now, but praise God, Jesus could come before the sun goes down tonight. And then all of our problems will end when we're gathered into his presence. So what does it look like to have a calm joy under the care and the guardianship of God's peace in the midst of chaos and calamity? It looks like moderation, a gentle spirit. I'm not freaking out. Number two, it looks like the Lord is near. The third thing that uh, this passage tells us is that when we are living with that sort of calm uh, spirit, understanding and thankful for the Lord's presence, what we experience and what we display will be unexplainable. Uh, it's unexplainable. Look at verse number seven. He says, and the pe- well, verse six, be careful for nothing in, in any circumstance, all the things that could rob you of your joy. Don't be anxious about those things, uh, but rather with moderation, understanding the Lord is with you in all those things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, verse 7, which is going to guard you, but look what it says in verse 7. The peace of God which surpasses or passeth all understanding. I love this. The peace of God which nobody else would ever know how in the world you're living in it. That when everybody around you is looking at you going, How in the world are you so calm? How do you have such resolute, I don't mean to say when things are bad, you're laughing, woohoo, life is great, but there's a resolute, moderated, non-freaking out, is there a word for non-freaking out? Non-freaking out response. It will be coming from a peace which nobody can understand. And you know what? Which even you won't understand. Because when it says it surpasses all understanding, it surpasses our understanding as well. That we wouldn't even be able to articulate it. How many times have you said or had somebody say to you, you know, I don't know, but here's, I know it's bad. I know it's tough. I know the diagnosis is terrible. But you know what? I'm at peace. I, God's given me peace about it. I just, I just have a peace. 
Well, that's what verse 7 is talking about. The peace that passes all explanation, transcends all understanding. So what Paul is saying is, look, I recognize you're choosing joy. You, you've been here every week. You're filling out your workbook. You, you want to have joy. You're making the right decisions. You're knowing the right things. You're growing in your walk with the Lord so you can have joy. But know this. There are these arrows, these darts, these circumstances that are firing into your life, and they all threaten to steal that joy. But your joy can be secure under the guardianship of the peace of God. So then the only question remaining is, well, so if peace, if God's peace is the warrior that secures my joy, how do I bring the warrior of peace to guard the house of joy in my life? How do I do that? Paul tells us, verse number six and seven again, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, you should underline that word, prayer, and supplication, another word for prayer, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now he says in verse number six, uh, don't be anxious, don't freak out, don't worry. A lot of things are going to attack, a lot of circumstances don't look so good, but don't panic. But in all of those things, as you're walking in joy, bring those to the Lord. Four different words, by the way, he uses uh, in verse number uh, six to talk about prayer. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into all four of those. I'm not going to, in fact, I'm not going to say much about this. I'm done. I, I want to close up because we're going to get into prayer next week. So be sure you're back next week because we'll, we'll pick up this idea of how do we understand the motivations of prayer and how do we unlock this, this fervent, passionate prayer life so that I'm not one of the 60% of men who never pray or the 40% of women who never pray. But I really want to be that guy or that gal who, who knows how, learns how, and, and thrives in prayer. But this is what Paul says. That rather than being anxious in all the things that you could be anxious about, bring those to God in prayer. So here's the point to jot down. It is that grateful prayers are the pathway to peace. Now this is really important. Grateful prayers are the pathway to peace. So if I want the warrior of peace to guard the house of joy, then all the things that could steal the joy out of my life, rather than fretting about them and, and worrying about them and constantly carrying around the weight of that anxiety, I'm going to begin to give those to God, inviting his peace as I lift these prayers to him. But he talks about prayers. It's a, the approach to God. He talks about supplications. These are, these are, these are uh, uh, the ways in which we make our needs known to God specific requests he mentions. But in all those three things, listen to what he says in verse number six. He says, with prayer and supplication, your request should be brought, how? With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. With gratitude. Wednesday night, Scott uh, Moody did such a fine job teaching us about lament. He taught us about the, the, all of the psalms that are psalms of lament where we cry out to God in desperation and brokenness. And we ought to do that. We're instructed to do that. And Scott did a great job teaching us on Wednesday night how to do it. But as we lament, and he said this at the end, this was the last part of his instruction to us in lamenting, is that lamenting ends with trust. It ends up. So that in all of my prayers, I'm, I'm moving on the trajectory of trust. See, the prayer that is not a prayer of thanksgiving is a prayer of why, what, how could you? Now, I'm not saying we never wrestle with some of those things in prayer. But I'm telling you that if you want to walk in the peace of God, everything that could drain the anxiety out of your life, bring it to the Lord, lament over it, don't be anxious about it, give it to him, and then end as you turn those prayers, make sure those are prayers that ultimately say, but, oh God, here's what I know. You've got this. I don't know the outcome. I don't know the circumstance. I don't know how I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I don't know how I'm going to breathe tomorrow. I don't know how I'm going to get through next week. But, God, I know that you know, and I thank you. I can trust you. Prayer with thanksgiving. Because we, as, as we express that trust in him, then the it invites the peace of God.
to secure our joy. A few minutes ago, I said to you that you should write down what are two or three of the things that cause you anxiety. And if you've done that, or if you do that a little later this afternoon, then I want to encourage you to take those things. And if you're honest and you're writing them down, now make them your prayer list. And so maybe you wrote down, let's say you wrote down family situation. And so, God, this family situation that I'm in is really, it's just draining the, the life out of me. It's draining the joy out of me. It's killing me. But God, I don't want to let it drain the joy out of me. I, I want to give it to you. So I want to I have joy. I'm asking you for your peace about this as I bring it to you. So God, this family situation could cause me anxiety. It could rob me of my joy. And then, and then end your prayer this way. But God, I thank you that I can trust you with this family situation. Now, usually family situations have a name, amen? <laughs> so God, I thank you that I can trust you with, fill in the name, fill in the blank. You see, bring those things, give them to God in prayer, and thank him that you can trust him in it. And what happens is, the warrior of peace begins to show up. I wasn't even in the military, that's pretty good, wasn't it? I've watched a bunch of military movies. <laughs> but the warrior of peace begins to surround your life and guard your joy. Here's the right choice to make today. Write it down. It is that today I choose to replace worry with thoughtful and grateful prayers, knowing that my God is sufficient for every need. If you believe he is, would you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. I might just, in closing, since this is our last Sunday morning in, in the book of Philippians for a while, direct your attention to chapter 4 and verse 19 of Philippians to close. The, the direct context of, of his uh, thought here in this passage is about their giving and, and their being generous, but the principle applies to all of life. Chapter 4, verse 19, he says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He is able. Amen.